Greetings, and welcome to Etz Heim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. We're continuing in our series today. We've been in for quite some time on a series I've entitled Love and Judgment. And today is part 10. And today I want to talk about love and our relationship with God is either a contract or a covenant. Uh, and I pray that through this series, God is opening up our eyes to his unsurpassable love for us. Uh, because there's opposition to that, right? Look at the, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Here's the opposition. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. We have it on the overhead as well. The God of this age, Satan, Asatan, He's blinded us. He's blinded the minds of the believers, of, of, of the unbelievers, I'm sorry, of the unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Messiah. Uh, the word glory here, a doxa, it refers to uh, um, God's character that's on display. It refers to his character on display, which means God's love on display. God's shining, awesome love. But when the enemy blinds us, we can't see this glory in Messiah, uh, who is the image of God. Uh, but that's for the unbelievers. They're blinded. But for the believers, look down at verse 6 now. Verse 6 says, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, that, that radiant revelation of God's love, uh, displayed in the face of Messiah. Paul says the God of this age blinds us keeps us from seeing uh, that radiant, brilliant, dazzling glory in the face of Yeshua. Which means that seeing Yeshua is first and foremost a spiritual issue, being able to see him. It's not primarily a logical or an exegetical or a verbal issue. It's a spiritual issue. Uh, which is why uh, we always need to be praying uh, that God would, would shine his light in our hearts, uh, to help us see what otherwise we could never see. That's why in John 17, in his last public prayer, Yeshua prays this in John 17, 23. He says, Father, help them to see that you've loved them with the same love that you have loved me. And in the same period, up in verse 22, the prior verse, John 17, 22, Yeshua says, I've given them the glory that you have given me. What is this glory? The glory is it's the awesome shininess, if you will, of God's love. The shininess of God's love is glory. Uh, that Yeshua shares this with us, he says. Uh, you can't get this on your own. It's a revelation from God. That's why Paul prays in Ephesians 3.18, he prays that we could have, would have the power, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is this love of Messiah. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to our normal minds, our finite fallen brains, uh, we don't have the power to know God's infinite love. Uh, uh, in our natural fallen state, we instinctively feel it, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's too good to be true. Which is why Paul prays here that we would be strengthened to understand God's eternal love. One of the signs of the true gospel versus the false gospel is that the true gospel displays a love so great that you can't believe it without divine revelation. The word gospel, uh, euangelion, uh, means good news. Uh, the true gospel is good news. It's, it's the greatest news you've ever heard. It's incomprehensibly beautiful. But the gospel that most of us here today in the West, most of us here, it's often distorted. And it ends up watering down and cheapening the true gospel, and it makes it mechanical instead of transforming. The gospel of most of us here today goes something like this. God created us for whatever reason, and he put us in this Garden of Eden, and he put, a put, and he put us there uh, to the test. He put a tree in the middle of it, and he said, don't eat of this tree, kind of like putting a cookie in front of a little kid saying, don't eat it. So he tests us, and there was a rule, do not eat from this forbidden tree. But we broke the rule, and God gets very mad when you break a rule. He's furious, 
And he's been pretty mad ever since. He tried to fix a problem uh, once by, by raising up this nation, Israel. He did it by giving them a bunch of rules. They weren't very good rule keepers either. So that plan kind of failed. And God got madder and madder. Finally, in a sort of plan B, he sends Yeshua into the world. And then this raging God who's so mad at all these Ross Ross rule breakers, he ends up taking out his wrath on Yeshua so that now he won't have to send us rule breakers to hell. And that's the gospel. Doesn't that sound familiar? Some of you are probably saying, yeah, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Isn't that what we're supposed to believe? I submit to you to, to, uh, that uh, how, while that popular version of the gospel bears some vague resemblance to the true gospel, it's actually a rather gross distortion. It doesn't have any of the beauty of the real gospel. It doesn't require any supernatural revelation to believe that version of the gospel. Is there a love so unfathomable in, in that gospel that you, can, you, you can't possibly believe it unless God empowers you to do so? I don't think so. There's something missing, vitally missing, in that version of the gospel. Uh, and what's missing, uh, what's, what's wrong, brings us to the core of the problem uh, uh, that we face today uh, in the modern Christendom in the in the West uh, that that and that we face in really grasping and being transformed by the true gospel, the gospel of God's love, the true gospel of His love, uh, and we're getting down now to the very core of the core, the center of the center, uh, and to get at that, I want to talk to you today about the difference between a contract and a covenant. Contracts and covenants may look superficially very similar on the surface, but in fact they're profoundly different. And the difference between a, co a covenant uh, and a contract will elucidate and will il illuminate the difference between the true gospel and the distorted version that I just gave you. Here's the difference. A contract is kind of like an employment deal. Uh, you work for me, I give you so much money. Or maybe it's like, like a purchase agreement. You know, you purchase a house, a car, an appliance. Uh, you get something for something. It's tit for tat. It's a quid pro quo. Uh, kind of an arrangement. That's a contract. A covenant is not like that. At least not a covenant of agape love. A covenant of agape love is like a marriage. And a marriage is not a contract. A marriage is not a 50-50 deal. A marriage is a 100% a 100% deal. Your very being is to be involved in it. If you try to do a marriage like a contract, it will not work. The best you'll do uh, won't even come close to what God has in mind for your marriage. A contract is a, is a legal deal between parties. Uh, it's between us, whereas a covenant is us. We're not really dealing with one another. Rather, we're pledging ourselves, we're pledging our lives to one another. A contract is always about law, whereas a covenant is about love. It's a pledge of love. I pledge myself to you. In contrast, a contract, it's always about laws uh, and rules and terms and the conditions of the contract. Uh, but a covenant is a pledge of love. Contracts are always conditional. You can cancel a contract if its terms are broken, whereas a covenant is unconditional. Uh, at least a covenant of agape, self-sacrificial, uh, you know, altruistic, divine love. It's unconditional. Uh, it involves you pledging yourself to the other person regardless of what that other person does. That's why in a marriage ceremony, we say for better or for worse, till death do us part. Uh, in a contract, it's always evaluative. In a contract, it always involves assessing things, judging things, measuring things. How are we doing each other and keeping the contract? There's always this assessment, this evaluation, this judging going on. Whereas in a covenant of agape love, it's about accepting the other person, accepting them as they are, because you pledge yourself to the other person as they are. These two arrangements, they may look similar on the surface, but there's a world of difference between a contract and a covenant. The Bible talks a lot about covenants. 
you hardly hear anything about contracts. Our core problem is that we look at everything in our consumeristic culture in contract terms rather than in terms of agape love. We look at everything and interpret everything through the categories of law, of law uh, uh, and deal-making rather than through the categories of love and pledge-making. It's let's make a deal with God versus let's fall in love with Yeshua. This goes all the way back to the very beginning. Bereshit, Genesis, chapter 3. The story in Genesis 3 is a story about how we, uh, as a race, have fallen from this agape love covenant worldview uh, to a legal contract worldview. Now, in the beginning, Adam and Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden, uh, and they walk with God in the cool of the day, literally in the Hebrew, in the evening breeze, and in the early evening when the temperatures are cooling off. Uh, this is the Bibles we have communicating. They had this amazing relationship with God that, that was innocent. Uh, and they hung out with God, and God hung out with them, uh, and they enjoyed one another. And that's what life was meant to be about. Uh, there, was, there, there was this blissful ign uh, innocence there, just innocence. In the middle of the garden, God planted these two trees, uh, right in the middle, meaning the very centerpiece of, of what our life was supposed to be about. Uh, there was a tree of life, which is God's provision for life, uh, and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the forbidden tree. But it wasn't there just because God wanted to test you, like putting a cookie in front of a kid uh, and telling him, no, don't eat this cookie. Rather, this other tree, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was God's loving, no trespassing sign. And life revolved around these two trees. And God said, trust me for my provision of life, the tree of life, and honor me by obeying my prohibition, which is not to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God's saying this, be like me, I created you to be in my image in terms of my character. Uh, expand my love. Be like me in how you treat one another. Be like me in that respect. But don't try to be like me in terms of wisdom. Don't try to be like me uh, in terms of thinking that you can know and you can define good and evil. Or, or to be judges of who's good and who's evil. Leave that to me. I'm the judge. You just be lovers in my image. This was God's loving, no trespassing sign. Unfortunately, Hasatan, the accuser, Satan shows up. His name means the accuser in Hebrew. And that's exactly what he does. He's the accuser of the brethren. He shows up in the garden and he first accuses God. He, he paints this, this distorted picture of God that, that's just monstrous. He, he, he convinces Adam and Eve that God's not this all loving God who's got their best interest in mind. Uh, he convinces them the tree is not this loving, no trespassing sign, but rather this tree is the key thing that they need to use in order to become fully actualized and fully enlightened uh, and fully empowered as human beings. They, you need this tree, he says. And in essence, he says, you know, God, he's threatened by that tree. You know, that's why he doesn't want you to eat of it, Eve. He doesn't want any competition. God is jealous of you, Eve. He's nervous you're going to be like him and eat of this tree. And, and, and uh, he's, he, he, he wants to keep that away from you. And he, uh, God is jealous of you. And he sees, he's a petty God, a competitive God, and he doesn't want what's best for you. He doesn't have your best interest in heart. He's holding back the very best from you, Eve. He won't let you have the knowledge that he has. And so Satan paints this very pathetic view of God. And unfortunately, it works. Adam and Eve are seduced into rebellion. They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we've been eating of that same tree ever since. Because this story is not just about long, long ago and in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> it's a story about our life right now. When we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we sin into existence a new kind of being the fallen humanity that we find ourselves in right now when we look in the mirror. A, a miserable creature, alien from what God originally intended us to be. A judging little creature. Instead of walking with God in the cool of the day, uh, in innocence, hanging out with God, enjoying just being with Him, now, instead, we aspire to be Him. We don't want to just be with Him, we want to be Him, to be God. And that's what the temptation was all about. Satan said, you can be like God, knowing good and evil. 
Uh, but the deception uh, is, is, is you become like him, not in the way he wants you to become like him, but in this other way, uh, in terms of the knowledge of, of good and evil. Uh, and so we aspire, we've got this impulse to, to be Lord of our own life. Uh, uh, we call the shots. And we, want, want to, and we also want to expand that to other people. We want to rule over other people as much as possible. We want to be God. And, and with this impulse comes this also this inclination, this, this instinctive habit of always wanting to eat of this tree, uh, to be wise like God, to think that we know other people's hearts uh, so that we can judge others. We love judging others, don't we? Especially in the church, we love judging other people, right? Uh, so we're always evaluating uh, and critiquing and criticizing. We're passing verdicts. Uh, we're judging. We're criticizing. We're constantly condemning others. Uh, and we do it compulsively. We do it incessantly. Uh, we, we do it subconsciously. It goes on in our brain all the time. We can, we can hardly turn it off. Even to ourselves, we do it. The accuser gets in our heads, and he makes us into little accusers. In his image. We now conform into his image. That's what we do. And it starts with ourselves. We first accuse ourselves. We see this in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, they're ashamed. Uh, they want to cover themselves. Uh, they want to hide themselves. As soon as they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they start judging themselves. Uh, they're embarrassed now to be around each other. Uh, they've got to cover themselves up uh, with this man-made fig leaf covering. Uh, they lose their innocence, and they're full of shame. When we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we get a mirror installed in our brain that's a very distorted mirror. And we're always looking in this mirror and saying, how am I doing? How am I doing? Uh, am I doing better than her? You know, what about her? What about she's doing? Look at her. Uh, how's it going? What do I look like? What do people think of me? How's my performance? And we're always evaluating ourselves. It's as though we've got these two me's inside my head, uh, the accused and the accuser. Kind of like if you've ever seen the Lord of the Rings, you know, Smeagol and Gollum you know, arguing with himself uh, between his good and his evil impulse. There's a spiritual war raging within us. And the reason we're not at home in our own heads is because we're trapped inside this, because we've got trapped inside this skull, uh, this nagging voice. And that voice is us. And the voice says, look what you did. Oh, oh you could have done better. Oh, what about this? Oh, what do they think of me? Uh, and this voice is constantly yapping at us. Uh, it's this miserable self-awareness. But it wasn't part of God's original design. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Uh, you can't walk with God calmly in a relaxed way in the cool of the day if you've got this pesky little accuser in your brain all the time. You know, when you have these peak experiences of love and, and joy and happiness and, or peace and, and adventure, uh, what makes these peak, what is it that makes these peak experiences in your life, think about it, what makes them such peak experiences that you just ravish and, and enjoy and, and like to remember about? One of the things is that for at least for that moment, the accuser shuts up. You lose yourself. You're abandoned to the moment. You're not assessing yourself or assessing anything. No, you're in that moment. And, and you're just wholly there. Uh, and it's so good, and it's so fun, and it's so freeing. You're like a child you learn, who hasn't learned yet to be self-critical. We just dance with the Lord, and we don't worry about what anybody else thinks. But the minute you start assessing yourself, the moment is gone. It's gone. And the accuser, he starts yapping again, and you lose the moment. And God in, but God intends us to live life like this relaxing walk with him in the cool of the day, in the evening breeze, without any of this internal conflict or, or polarity going on inside, this, this me versus me. On top of that, we feel empty inside because of our rebellion. Uh, we've alienated ourselves from our creator. Uh, we were made for our creator. He's our source of life and worth and significance. But now we're separated from him. Now, and we feel that. Everybody in the core of their being, whether they realize it or not, misses God. Misses walking with him in the cool of the day that we did in the, in, in the morning of our creation. And we want to get back there somehow. Maybe you don't know, maybe you don't know that. Now, maybe you don't realize that. But that's this yearning that you have deep within you. 
<laughs> trying to fill this God-shaped vacuum in your soul. It's like a lost memory that unconsciously you keep yearning for. And what it really is, is the yearning of a lover for her beloved. The yearning of a lost lover for her beloved. It's this undefinable ache in the innermost being of your soul. That's what it is. But here's what happens. Because you've got this accuser inside of our head, uh, this yearning becomes an alien thing. If we're connected with God, um, we wouldn't feel this. If we were truly connected with him, we wouldn't feel this unfulfilled yearning and longing. And so part of us knows it's not supposed to be like this. But the accuser, what he, he's very tricky. He then indicts us for it. You know, it's really the most authentic part of our being. It's kind of our homing device. But now the accuser gets inside of our head, uh, and so it feels like there's something wrong with us. There's something defective about us. We're guilty. Uh, there's this chronic, nagging sense that something's off, something's missing. So the accuser says, yeah, and he starts accusing us. And then what happens next is then we start to accuse other people. Because the accused part of me, inside of me, wants to deflect the attention. If I can accuse somebody else, well, then at least momentarily, it relieves me from my own guilt uh, and anxiety and my own dissatisfaction, at least a little bit. It's like when I was a little kid, uh, I, I know you can't believe this, but I once swore at my father, and he was going to wash my mouth out with soap. They did that back then. <laughs> However, uh, to my great luck, at the very same time, my older sister, she did something even worse. Uh, and then she got in this big fight with my dad, and she swore at him. And it got my dad all distracted from punishing me. And so I'm thinking, yes, thank you, God. <laughs> and because my sister's sin was worse than mine, uh, I'm now focused on this comparison with her. And I'm feeling very good about myself because she's worse than me. It makes me feel good about myself, at least for the moment, because I escaped the wrath of my dad. And that's what we do in our brain all the time. We see it in Genesis 3. You know, the first thing Adam does is he deflects on himself. He blames Eve, you know, the woman you gave me. Then Eve blames who? The serpent, right? Uh, and Cain blames Abel. Uh, and we've been blaming each other all the time ever since because it feels good. I'm not so pathetic, maybe, if I can find someone else who's more pathetic than me, or at least convince myself that they're worse than I am. So we're always doing this comparing uh, and contrasting type of thing. You know, well, well, maybe I gossip, but at least I'm not a fornicator like her. Or maybe I'm a glutton, but at least I'm not a liar and a cheat like him. Yes, I confess, maybe I view porn, but at least I'm not greedy and a miser like that guy. But Yeshua's teachings and his exhortation to take the log out of our own eye before we try to take a speck of dust out of somebody else's eye was meant to cut us off of the knees from all this game playing. All of our sizing up and measuring and comparing and contrasting and judging ourselves with others. Because that's what we do. We try to convince ourselves that our sins aren't at least as bad as someone else's sins, so therefore we can feel good about ourselves. So we accuse ourselves. And then to deflect that, we accuse others, and it all comes right from the enemy. And then third, finally, we accuse God. We judge God. Our eating from the forbidden tree uh, is at work in our brain all the time. So Adam and Eve, they now hide from God, uh, and they're terrified. Whereas the day before, they were walking with him in the evening breeze, in the cool of the day. He was their friend. Now God shows up, and they're terrified. What's up with this? God didn't change. They've changed. Uh, they put on this lens. Uh, they're now looking at God through these spectacles. The spectacles of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The spectacles of sizing up, measuring, uh, accusation, evaluation, fear, criticizing, passing verdicts, condemning, judging. So now they see God to be some monster. Uh, uh, and they hide from him and they blame him. Adam says, it's your fault, God. It was you who gave me this woman, right, uh, who did all this. So it's really ultimately your fault, God. And we project onto God all of our own inner accusations. We judge God. We make him out to be the accuser. 
He's the perpetually angry, ticked-off judge in the sky. He's the cosmic cop, the cosmic lawyer who's always building a case against us, a case for that dreaded judgment day. And that's why we're so afraid of death. He's this, he's this vindictive hangman to some people, roaming the streets, hanging whoever makes him mad, or he's the God who maybe arbitrarily sends down on you earthquakes or, or pestilence or famine or cancer to smite you. We make God out to be the accuser. That's how the enemy deceives us. This is how he puts blinders on us. So we cannot see the glory of God in the face of Yeshua. Why? Because we're seeing God as the accuser, which means we're seeing the accuser as God. And who's the accuser? It's Satan. This has been his plan all along. He wants to be God. So Satan tries to blind us to the true character of the true God. And they'll turn us into legalists and lawyers instead of worshipers and lovers. And so we tend to see everything in these terms of legalities and rules and rule breaking. Everything in accusatory terms. Everything in contract terms. Everything in a court of law uh, type of mentality, of mindset, focused on externals uh, uh, and, and uh, legal fine print and stipulations and loopholes and technicalities. Our standing before God is seen as the TV show, Let's Make a Deal. This is viewing the universe through the lens of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We judge ourselves, we judge others, we judge God, we judge the world. And in that judgment framework, this legal contract worldview, there's no place for other-oriented, choice-based, self-sacrificial, agape love. There's no place for unconditional love in that worldview. You can't have altruistic, unconditional love in a world that's defined by how you, def by how you assess things and size things up and the deals you make and, and the quid pro quo and the tit for tat kind of arrangements. There's no place for agape love. The best you can hope for is a good deal from God. Uh, maybe getting off the hook for the way you've broken a deal. Uh, so it's not surprising that when the gospel gets presented in that kind of let's make a deal framework, let's buy my fire insurance, uh, it comes out as a purely legal deal based on external technicalities uh, and correct verbal confessions if I say the right magic words, uh, and I, this magic formula now is going to save me. It's all about the legalities and making this purchase transaction between me and God for my eternal fire insurance. The cosmic judge, God, has a case against me. In fact, uh, he's pronounced an eternal death sentence on me. But fortunately, Yeshua, my advocate, he takes my place. And the angry judge vents his wrath against Yeshua so that now I don't have to be sent to hell. Yeshua is judged in my place by this raging father so that I don't have to be judged and killed. That's the contract worldview of the gospel. And in this sort of let's make a deal framework, we're certainly grateful, yes, but we're grateful in the sort of way that I was grateful when my sister got the beating instead of me. <laughs> I escaped wrath, the wrath of my father. <laughs> but that didn't, hear me well, that didn't make me love my dad. It didn't make me want to hang out with him in the cool of the day. No, if anything, all it did was confirm my fear of my father. This legal version of the gospel has some elements of truth in it. But it's not the fullness of the beautiful good news of the scriptures. It has a resemblance and contains some truth, but it doesn't capture the beauty and the goodness of the good news. It's, 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 it's not this outlandishly beautiful good news of the new covenant. It doesn't take the Holy Spirit's supernatural empowerment to believe the cosmic lawyer story I've just told. Uh, is there such an unfathomable love conveyed in that story there that only God could empower you to believe it? No, that version doesn't require the work of the Holy Spirit to believe in the unfathomable love of God because that version doesn't have the unfathomable love of God in it to believe. There's nothing unfathomably beautiful about that story. It's just a fortunate deal. Uh, we escape wrath. Uh, we live another round. That, that's the, that, that is the version of the legal story. But I submit to you it is not the good news of the love story of the true gospel. 
The story of how a broken contract gets fixed is, is one thing, but it's not the story of an agape love, covenant fulfilling God. It's a legal story, not a love story. It's a story of God saying, let's make a deal. It's not the story of, of God saying, let me transform you by my outrageous love. That version of the gospel is a story of a cosmic lawyer and criminals being acquitted. But it's not the story of a good shepherd, desperately, out of love, looking for his lost sheep. It's not the story of the woman, desperately looking for her beloved lost coin. It's not the story of the father of the prodigal son, uh, who unconditionally accepts his son coming back, even though his son has squandered his inheritance and smells like pigs, yet he unconditionally hugs him and embraces him and throws a party for him. It doesn't capture the beauty of that story. It's not the story of our heavenly husband. Coming down out of heaven, searching for his bride, even though she has prostituted herself to other lovers and sold herself into slavery, yet he'll do anything to redeem his bride and take her back to be his wife. It's not the story of a God who's crazily, madly in love with us so that he will, he will do anything and he has done anything. He's gone to hell and back so that we can be redeemed and rescued and spend eternity with him. Amen. Now, you see, in the purely legal court of law, contract version of the gospel, uh, it misses all this essential part of the story. It misses all of this. It misses the key part of, of, of this. Uh, it, it's, it isn't just a, some legal story, but it's the greatest love story ever told. A court of law version of the gospel has an accurate legal framework, but all the beauty and the depths of it has been sucked out of it. The good news, the real good news, is about the glory of God shining in the face of Yeshua. It's not about tweaking a contract. It's not about Yeshua coming as plan B 2,000 years ago to fix something that was broken. No. It's about a covenant of agape love that reaches back before the creation of the world. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. God is agape love. That's what it says in the Greek. God is agape love. He didn't all of a sudden decide to start loving at one point. No. From eternity to eternity, he is perfect, unwavering, unsurpassable, uh, uh, impossible, uh, un unfathomable, incomprehensible, beautiful agape love. Amen. Father, Son, and Spirit, he is that. United eternally in this ecstatic dance of perfect, other-oriented, choice-based, self-sacrificial agape love. And it, it, this never began. It always has been. Ephesians 1 tells us from even before the, the, the beginning, the creation of the universe, beginning of time, this was God's plan. To share that love with his crea creation. To bring us, to bring humanity into this dance. To share his love with us. From the very start, it's plan A. God wanted to become one of us so that we could become one with him. That plan was there, we're told in Ephesians, before the foundation of the world. From the beginning, God the Father wanted to acquire a bride for his son. And, and to do so by entering into this agape love marriage covenant with you and with me. Indeed, Ephesians 5 says, we're told that the goal is for the joy of our relationship with God to resemble the joy and the ecstasy of an intimate marriage relationship. Amen. That's what Ephesians 5 is all about in this whole marriage analogy. Which means that Yeshua coming to this earth wasn't some plan B. He didn't come as an afterthought to fix a problem. Yeshua's coming was always plan A. He came to fulfill the yearning of God, to enter into this agape love covenant with us. He came to acquire a bride. Now Yeshua had to die on the cross because the bride he came to acquire had gotten herself into such a lot of trouble. We had rebelliously and unfaithfully gone after other lovers. We sold ourselves into bondage to Satan. We were headed for destruction. But Yeshua comes to rescue us and he died for us. And he didn't become a human being and die because he was mad at us. He came and died on the cross because he was madly in love with us. John 3, 16. 
God so loved us, the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, life eternal. Because God is covenant love. Everything he does for us, he does out of his covenant love. And this is what covenant love does. It lays down its life for the beloved. It's like this. Let's say, for example, my wife, Elizabeth, who's, who's not here today, but I'm going to talk about her. <laughs> Let's say she's in some house, and it's on fire, uh, and she's trapped in this house. You know what? I'm going in for her. I'm going into that house after her. I'm going to break down the door and break down the window. Maybe I'll get cut up real bad. Maybe I'll be burned alive. But it doesn't matter. I'm going in. Why? Because I love her. Because I'm madly in love with her. And because that's what covenant love does. You know, and even if she got herself trapped in that building by her own foolishness, I'm not going to sit outside and start judging her for that. While the fire is raging, I'm going in. Why? Because that's what covenant love does. And even if, hypothetically, she's in there for some sinful reason, which she would never do, but even if she was there, uh, for example, to, to meet some guy, uh, and, 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 uh, and, I, and, and I know that. I find that out. And this guy's crazy, and he turns on her, and he ties her up in this burning building. I'm still going in for her. Because that's what covenant love does. And, and, I, and I won't uh, be, be having her guilt on my mind when I'm doing it. I wouldn't be judging her or going in there out of anger. Uh, I'm not going in that house, that burning house, because I'm mad at her. I'm going in because I'm madly in love with her. And I would trust that my self-sacrificial love would be the very thing that would bring her back Amen. to me. Because that's what covenant love does. I will win her over. Uh, uh, my heart will be breaking. But my first thought would be, I love her. Uh, I want to be with her. She needs to be rescued. So I'm going in. And the fact that sin is involved, uh, the fact that the house is on fire, it's not going to stop me from pursuing my bride. And it didn't stop God from pursuing his bride. He's coming for us, and he came for us, even though our house is on fire. This is exactly the relationship between God and us, and us and God. God, from the very start, planned on becoming one of us, and one with us, and acquiring a human bride. But his bride was unfaithful. We were unfaithful. And chased after other lovers, and foolishly got ourselves tied up inside of a house by the devil. And the house is set on fire by our sin. Uh, and then that our sin is what empowers the devil to light the match. And Yeshua looks on us. And he sees our plight. And he says, I still want my bride. He says, I'm going in, not because I'm mad, but because I'm madly in love with you. Despite your sin and your unfaithfulness. Because that's what covenant love does. And God, from eternity to eternity, is covenant a God they love. Yeshua came not to fix a broken legal contract, but to fulfill his beautiful, marvelous covenant of eternal agape, self-sacrificial love for us. He sacrificed himself while we were yet sinners to win us back, <laughs> to woo us by displaying for us the glory of God in himself. Amen. The radiant, shining Love of God in the face of Yeshua. He says, see my heart. See my love for you. I want you to come back. I want you to share in this dance with me for all eternity. That's why Yeshua doesn't respond in anger and resentment for our sin. For our sin. No, read the parables. That's not how Yeshua responds. When the prodigal son returns, what does the father do? Does he scold him? No, he throws a party. When the good shepherd finds his lost sheep, he throws a party. When the woman finds the lost coin, what does she do? She throws a party. When the sinners come back to the Lord, the angels in heaven throw a party and rejoice. <laughs> Yeshua is throwing a party because his bride, who was once lost, now through the cross has been found. 
And whenever you put your trust in, in, in the Lord and surrender your life to Him, Yeshua throws a welcome home party for you. That's why in Hebrews 12, 2, it says, For the joy set before Him, Yeshua endured the cross and in scorned its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne on God, for the throne of God, for the joy set before Him. Yeshua did it for the joy. He didn't come to earth because he was mad. He came to earth because he's madly in love with you. He's angry at sin because it's destroying his beloved bride. It's destroying you. It's destroying me. But there is joy in Yeshua's heart. Indeed, John 15, 11, Yeshua says, I've come that my joy may be fulfilled in you and that your joy may be complete. He says, I want to share with you my joy. That's why I'm here. I'm madly in love with you, individually, each one of you, just like the good shepherd leaves behind the 99 and goes after that one lost sheep. He loves each of you individually. He would have gone to the cross just for you. He is madly in love with you. He does whatever it takes to get you back. Yeshua runs into this burning house. He ran into this burning house for you. He suffered and died to rescue you. Even though you were the unfaithful lover, whatever it takes, he's willing to do. Why? Why? Because that's what covenant love does. Yeshua is perfect, eternal, self-sacrificial, beautiful covenant love. Amen. But so long as we're viewing the world from this knowledge of good and evil, from our original sin, we won't get it. That's the blinders the enemy has put on us in the garden. We view God as the accuser, so we fear him. Uh, we hide from him. These blinders, uh, they're also our own compulsion uh, to assess others, to, to size others up, to, to judge everybody. Our thinking and our relationship with God has become some legal contract. But God says, no. Return to your original innocence. Become like a little child. See me as I truly am. I'm the father running down the street to embrace my prodigal son. As a husband, I'm the one who's diving into that burning house to rescue my wayward bride. Yeshua wants us to, to, to walk in, walk with us in the, in the evening breeze, in the cool of the day. He wants us to trust him. He wants you to surrender your life to him whether it's for the first time today or whether it's uh, renewing your commitment to him today because you're not walking with him you know the, the way you, you know you should be. It's not about a contract. It's about a covenant, a covenant of agape love. Amen. Let's stand. I'm going to ask the music team to come on up. And we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask the music team maybe just to play softly a little bit in the background while we're praying. And then to close us with, with some songs. As we, as we worship the God together, hallelujah, we worship him for his love and for all he's done for us. He's that faithful husband who runs into the burning house for us, the unfaithful bride. Not because he's mad at you, but because he's madly in love with you. Hallelujah. Father, we just bow our hearts before you now. We confess to you, Lord, that we have not been a faithful bride to you. But we want to, Lord, we want to be faithful, covenant partners. Please, Lord, forgive us for minimizing our relationship with you, uh, for turning it into some mere legal contract, mere fire insurance, mere believism, and saying the right magic words. Forgive us for reducing it to, to legalities and technicalities and, 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 and filing it away in some file cabinet in the corner of our lives rarely to be consulted almost like a, a will we only consult when we're dead but as we prepare now for the upcoming high holy days coming up in the next two weeks lord we ask you to search our hearts your scripture tells us to examine ourselves lord we ask you to shine your light upon our hearts search us lord and know us know know our, 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 all of our parts lord show us lord where there's any untrue, uh, untoward, unfaithful way in us, any, any, any unclean way in us, Lord. Lord, we repent right now of not truly loving you, of not truly living for you, of not truly entering into that marriage covenant with you and living in that marriage covenant, Lord. 
of not truly laying down our life for you and sacrificing all for you because that's what covenant love does. We repent of seeing you, Lord, as mere fire insurance. Help us to see you, that you see from you, Lord, that you want so much more from us, that you want a truly love relationship with us, Lord, like a husband for a bride. Help us to see that you want a covenant relationship with us, a covenant of agape love. Thank you, Lord, for ascribing infinite worth to me as you create me in your image. Lord, now we ask you now to recreate me in the image of Yeshua. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that even when I was unfaithful to you, when I was a spiritual adulterer, Lord, that you came to earth, that you left your heavenly glory, that you suffered and died for me. You left the 99 and came after me, Lord, and you rose again on the third day. Thank you, Lord, for your choice-based, because you've chosen me, Lord. You're choice-based, other-oriented. You're oriented towards me, Lord. It's not self-centered, but it's other-oriented, self-sacrificial. You lay down your life, agape love. You're choice-based, other-oriented, self-sacrificial, agape love. Lord, why well, want to love you back right now in the same way, Lord? We want to love you back in that way. Right now, Lord, from the bottom of my heart, Lord, I want to pray this, Lord, to renew my marriage vow with you today. I want to rededicate myself to my marriage covenant with you, Yeshua. And Lord, I pledge my heart. I pledge my life. I pledge my priorities and my aspirations and my obedience to you. Help me now, Lord, to be the faithful spouse and a, a, a passionate lover of you. Lord, we worship you. We thank you. We glorify you. We adore you. We praise you. We bow before you. We exalt you. We magnify you, Lord. We love you. You, Yeshua, are the lover of our soul. And we love you, Lord. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. For more information, visit us at www. Dot etzheim dot org. That's spelled E I T Z dash C H A I M dot org. Or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services. 